We're going to jump into um, our series called Stewardship. However, oh, it, it, it broke it up a little. Oh, okay, that's good. That's good. Stewardship. All right, we're going to change it up because how many know that, that when it comes to the resources that God's entrusted to us, uh, your money, uh, uh, your income, whatever, is connected to the heart. All right, and so, so stewardship is simply a way, uh, really the word means when someone entrusts you with like their property, you take care of it. You're good stewards of that. And so I want to start right off at the beginning. I need to establish something you need to know. Uh, this very important thing, uh, nothing we claim to own is actually ours. Did you know that? Not a thing you have is actually yours. You think, well, I worked hard for that car. I worked hard for that. It doesn't matter how hard you work. None of it is ours. Well, how do you know that, Bill? Well, let me show you. There's a verse in Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it the world, and all who live in it. So nothing we have is actually ours. God owns it all, right? How many, how many are you you're planning to take your stuff with you when you die? Show of hands, anybody? Exactly. We can't because it wasn't meant to be ours. It's not ours. It's all God's, right? So if God owns it all, then why do I try so hard to keep it? I don't know. Maybe you're the same way. I don't know why I try so hard to keep what's not even mine. Speaking of keeping things that aren't mine, uh, let, let, me, let me ask you this. Have you ever uh, let someone borrow something that you have, and, and, uh, or maybe you're like, oh, I got a great book for you. You know what? Give it a read, and when you're done, just pass it back. Or maybe you have a tool in your garage, and you're like, oh, yeah, you need a drill. Come over. I got it for you. And then the day comes when you're looking for that item or whatever it is. You're like, they didn't give it back to me. I told, I, 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 like, I remember giving it to him and I didn't get it back. I mean, we see it all the time if you have kids, right? They take things sometimes that aren't theirs. I've seen it so many times. You know, my, one of my kids has, has a toy. They put it down for a minute. And their younger brother comes in and swoops it up and starts playing with it. And then they go back to get it and like, Dad, he won't give me back my toy. Well, and then I go in, you know, okay, whose toy is it? Well, it's his toy. Okay, well, you got to give it to him. No, it's mine. It's mine. I'm like, it's not yours. It's your brother's. I found it first. It's mine. Don't take it away from me. See, God gives us resources. He gives us income. He gives us money. And then when he asks for some of it back, we're like, no, it's mine. It's mine. It's mine. Robert Morris said this, no one is a born giver. We are born takers. Did you know that? It's just the way it is, right? Just like you don't have to teach a child to be bad, you don't have to teach us to be greedy. We're just good at it. We're born selfish. We really are because we think it's all ours. So being generous is, not so, it, it is something that we have to be taught. Because we're born takers. We have to be taught generosity. And hopefully there will become there will come a time when it goes from here to here. And it's something that's caught. You know, it's not just teaching that Jesus has. And I'm like, okay, I know what Jesus teaches about generosity and giving. But all of a sudden now it's like something that I own. Like I caught it. I understand the power in this. And that's the whole point of this series on stewardship, on, on giving, on finances. Is that we will be generous and good stewards of what God has entrusted to us. So in order for us to understand the importance of giving, we have to understand where God fits in my life. Where God, where is God in your life? Is he 15th? Is he 5th? Is he 1st? Because that will let you know if you're generous or not. Because if he's 1st, then we're going to easily do what Proverbs chapter 3 teaches us. It says that to honor the Lord with your wealth with the first fruits of all your crops. Some other translations say, with the first fruits of your increase or the first fruits of your income. You have to understand, oftentimes a person was known to be wealthy by how many herds of cattle or, or sheep or, or goats, whatever they had. Like that, that was a good indicator that you were well off or how much pasture you had. Or, or I mean, it was often tied up if you had bountiful crops or stuff like that. 
Some of you who, who, who are farmers here, you know all about that. You know, some seasons are good. Some seasons aren't so good. So, so some version, I, I like the way the, the Message Bible puts it. It says, honor God with everything you own. Give him the first and the best. Give him the first and the best. And that's what we want to talk about to you today, the first and the best. Last week I talked to you, and if you didn't get a chance to listen to it, it was called, you know, when Jesus said, you can't serve two masters, either you serve God or you serve mammon. You serve money. And we talked about who this God mammon is. And so if you want to listen to that, check it out, because we're in our second week of the stewardship series. So I want to start off in the book of Genesis. I want to read this to you. I'm not sure if it ever given you any trouble, um, but it has me. Um, later, she gave birth to his brother Abel, talking of Eve, right? Adam and Eve had a couple kids, and, uh, and one of the, 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 the brothers was Abel, and Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. So you got the first two kids on earth. One's a, a, a farmer, or one, one works the soil, one keeps flocks. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. And so Cain went away angry and his face was downcast. Now, now I used to have trouble with this verse because it was just confusing. Like, both brought an offering. Why did Abel get God's favor and Cain didn't like like I don't I didn't understand like both had things that were you know God gave them and they're bringing an offering to God to say thank you and then one day it hit me right in this bit of this passage the Bible clearly uses uh, Cain brought some fruit of his uh, of the soil and as an offering to the Lord but but Abel brought some fat portions of the firstborn of his flock. Now, it, 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 maybe some of you know this, maybe others of you, this could be new information, but, but firstborn in the Bible is a big deal. This word firstborn is, is very important, and some of you are firstborn in your family, you're, you're like, yep, we are a big deal. Yes, we are. The Bible made it a point to tell us that Abel gave the firstborn of his flock. In other words, the best and the first. I almost get the picture that Cain was like, wow, look at all the fruit I have. Look at all the vegetables. This year has been like, like amazing. What did he call when you have like very good, like you have a very good, um, I am not a farmer. I don't know anything about it. When, you, when your crop's really good, is there a bumper crop? So you know, that's like a really good year. And I think, well, maybe Cain had a bumper crop year. And, uh, and, uh, and it's like, wow, this is amazing. Look what all we got, honey. We got so much food. I mean, this is incredible. And he takes all the, the, made, like the good vegetables and, and then, you know, the, the ones that are bruised or they, they didn't turn out quite the way they should have turned out. We'll, we'll put those over in the corner. And it's almost like, well, what are we going to do with that excess stuff that we don't want? Well, how about we take it and give it to an offering to God? But the Bible says that Abel, he didn't do that. He gave the first and the best. As I mentioned to you, or like, like firstborn is, is, is a very key word in Scripture. In Exodus 13, Romans 8, along with so many other ones, God clearly puts an emphasis on this word firstborn. In, in the Old Testament, they would take the firstborn and I want to sacrifice it to God. It was huge. Their currency was often in animals and crops. So when you offered your firstborn of your livestock, in a way it was to trust God that he's going to provide more. It was like, God, okay, here's the firstborn that you've given to us. How about we wait till more are born, and then we'll give you the first? It wasn't like that. It's like that first animal that comes out, we have to sacrifice this to God, trusting that he's going to provide more. So it was a, it was a faith step. It was, we're going to give God the very first. We're going to give God the best. So God getting the first is extremely important. But what happens if the firstborn had some sort of blemish or, or disease or, or, or in, like imperfection? 
Well, what would they do then? Because that's not the first and the best. It might be the first, but it's not the best. And so God provided a solution for that. There had to be another animal that was spotless, without blemish, and that animal will be used as a substitute for the firstborn that, that just didn't meet the standards. If the firstborn was clean, then it was sacrificed. If it was unclean, then another animal had to be redeemed. Like, like they use this word redeemed or substituted. Another, another perfect animal had to be put into place, had to be used as a sacrifice because the, the first one wasn't clean enough. And because offering your first and the best to God was a huge deal, it still is a big deal. And I don't know if you're aware of that. Sometimes we, we read things in the Bible and we think, yeah, but that was for then. Well, often it's still for now. And I believe with all my heart, this very same thing applies to today. Anyone familiar with the story of Abraham and Sarah? Abraham and Sarah, they, they couldn't have children. They couldn't have children. And so, so they didn't pray a few months, God, we would be so grateful if you would give us a child. But they prayed not years. They prayed decades. 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 Sarah couldn't have children. And they prayed, God. Would you, would you give us a child? I don't know about you, but sometimes praying the same prayer over and over and over can get discouraging. It really can. So they pray year after year, decade after decade, and finally, finally God hears their prayer, hears their cry. Don't forget Luke chapter 18. It says to always pray and never give up. And this was a great example of of Abraham and Sarah praying. And then she finds herself pregnant. And the Bible says they give birth to their firstborn son. Their firstborn son. Abraham says, I'm going to give you a son. And this son will carry on your name. This son, he will produce descendants as, as great as the sands of the sea. I mean, the beaches that we walk on, we see all the... God's like, you can't even count that stuff. It's just going to be like your offspring. You're not even going to be able to count it. And so God says, here you go. Here's your firstborn son. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to tell you this part, but you need to go and sacrifice him now. Now, for some of us, most of us here, we know how the story ends. So we're like, well, okay, anyway, not that big of a deal because we know everything's going to be okay. But can you imagine Abraham who didn't really know? How confusing that is. But God, you told me that through this son, we're going to have descendants as great as the sand. Like, like, and now you're telling me to sacrifice him. But if you know the story, God would never do that. God wouldn't tell us to sacrifice our children. That's the God of Mammon. Remember the God of Mammon we talked about last week? They would take their children and sacrifice it to this idol God because they wanted this God, this statue, to give them prosperity and give them money. So, so they would do those things. But God doesn't do those kind of things. And wouldn't you know, he just wanted to, he wanted to, oh, there's all kinds of interpretations. Why did God do that? I don't know why God does the things that he does. He's God, I'm not. But God's like, you need to sacrifice this son. And so Abraham, like, God, I don't understand this. I don't know why you're doing this. But listen, God, I will trust you. You told me that he's going to produce descendants that I can't even count. So, so God, I, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. You sure you want me to do this? God, I'm going to do this. And, and then just before Abraham follows through, God provides a what in, its, in, in Isaac's place? Yeah, a lamb. And, and what's this words we got on the screen? He provided this lamb as a substitute to take the place of Isaac. Abraham's like, wow. Our name really, God, you kept your promise. And God tells Abraham, it's going to be okay. As I said, if you were and I were to read the story, we'd be like, how could God do this? God, he trusted you and he prayed for a son and you gave him a son and now you want to take him away. But Isaac was redeemed by God, giving another sacrifice in his place. And so you're thinking, okay, wow, that's great. That's, that's a great reminder of this whole story. But what in the world does this have to do with giving? Well, I'm glad you asked. To be redeemed means to make right. To be redeemed means to restore or to bring back. 
And so God's intention right from the beginning of time, he created us to be in relationship with himself. But just as we're born takers and not born givers, we're also born in the sin, not holiness. And because we're born in the sin, God had to figure out a way of like this blemished, speaking of us, the, the, this, this humanity that I've created is, 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 is full of disease, full of blemishes, full of def- like, like just full of sin. And God's like, I gotta somehow, I can't, sa- I can't allow them to be sacrificed to make them pure. I have to substitute someone else on their behalf. One that is perfect. And we read about it in Luke chapter 2. Mary and Joseph, they went to register because a census said that they had to go and kind of identify themselves. And so they traveled to Bethlehem and Joseph was pledged to be married to Mary and they were expecting a child. And while they were there, the Bible says the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn. Interesting, firstborn. Firstborn. Firstborn son. Jesus is God's firstborn son. Clean, perfect, spotless, unblemished. Jesus had to come to humanity in order to redeem us back into a relationship with God. It's through Jesus that we can actually get back into relationship with God who created us for that purpose. And that's why there is no other way to God other than Jesus. There's all kinds of places, people that say, no, there's all kinds of ways. No, there's no other way than through Jesus Christ, God's first and best. And see, the principle of first fruits, firstborn, is very powerful even still today. The Israelite people gave God the first and best of everything. It all belonged to God. They understood that. Actually, in 2 Corinthians Chapter 8, verse 5, uh, Paul was saying, and, and, and they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. The people in the early church are like, God is first in our lives. He always gets the first. He always gets the best. He doesn't ever get leftovers. He's God. He gets the best of the best. You and me and our families, our jobs, our homes, our lives, our finances. Because money and finances and the heart are connected. They really are. I said this last week. I believe one of the greatest indicators to know if you're generous or not is is in your giving. How many you 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 are a financial counselor? Anybody in the place you're a financial counselor? Some of you might be. Anybody, you, do you want to be a financial counselor? Yeah, I was going to, we'll, we'll have prayer for you after if, uh, if that's you. Man, numbers and people who do this for a living, like accountants and bookkeepers and finance, oh my gosh, so not for me. But let's just pretend that you are one, okay? Let's pretend you're a financial counselor and you have two clients that you're seeing today. All right, so, so your first client, you're sitting at your desk, uh, your secretary, you know, buzzes your phone and, and you pick it up. Yeah, what do you want? Um, and, and then she says, well, 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 your first client's here. And, 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 and you say, I was thinking of, uh, what, well, I, can't, I can't remember what movie it was. Anyway, um, the two clients come in. The first client, says, okay, send her in. So she walks in, an elderly woman, um, and, and, and your second client is a middle-aged man. All right, so your first client, this, this older lady, she comes in and she sits down and you say, what can I do for you, ma'am? And she says, well, well recently my husband died and, and, uh, and he did everything. He, he paid the bills. He, he, you know, he, he, he provided with his income. I, I, was a, I, didn't, I didn't have a career. I didn't have a job. I stayed at home with the kids. And, and he passed away. And, and through some, I don't know how it all happened, but, but he, he died and he didn't leave me with anything. I just don't, I don't know how those were. I need some advice. And, and so she says, I've been struggling and I'm down to the last few dollars. And she says, she tells you that she's got no more money and she doesn't even have enough in her house to really eat. And she says this mind-blowing thing to you right in that meeting. She says, listen, I, I, I don't know what I'm going to do, but, but I'm a God-fearing woman. And I, I just feel God told me that, that 
I need to take this last bit of money I have and I need to, I need to put it in the offering plate this week at church. So what would you tell her if that were you? I'd probably say something like this. I'm like, you know what? That's quite generous of you, but God gave you a brain, so please use it. Like, you have common sense for a reason. God knows you want to give, and, and, I, and he knows you have a desire to give. And having that desire is, is good enough, I think. Wanting to give, I mean, I should applaud you with that. So, so if you want my advice, I think maybe keep the money and buy yourself some groceries with it. What do you think? God's going to like send food down from the sky or something? He's going to multiply like some fish or bread? Like what do you, God wants you to do the sensible thing. So, so if you're asking my advice as a financial planner, maybe you should keep the money. I feel pretty good about that advice. So she leaves and then second client comes in and he's a middle-aged man and he comes in. And I mean, word around town is that he's very successful. He's hardworking. He's a farmer. And they're cr- a bumper crop that year. It was incredible. His business is doing so good that he's planning on on constructing some new buildings and he's buying more equipment to make more money so he can have even more to retire on. And so I'm he's telling me that and I'm like, "Well, why are you coming to me for advice?" Like it sounds like you got it all figured out. Like if I were man, like like I wish I were you. You must be doing something right cuz God sure is blessing you. And he gets up and like, well, yeah, I guess he is. And so he leaves. Now, I'm thinking pretty good of myself. Like, I didn't really need to give a whole lot of advice to this farmer. And the first lady, I mean, come on. You don't have a whole lot. Keep some for yourself. I think it's pretty reasonable advice. I I think it's some sound, good quality advice right there. Then all of a sudden, I'm reading the Bible one day and And wouldn't you know, these two same stories are actually in the Bible. Wow. So let's see what God said, because I would have said maybe something completely different than God. Here's what God said to the poor widow in Mark chapter 12, who gave her last two coins. I said last week, like, I don't understand why Jesus didn't just jump in and say, no, 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 that, that's all you have. Don't, don't put it in the plate. Don't put it in a big metal box. Go and buy yourself some food with it. But Jesus didn't. Jesus allowed her to give it anyway. And we pulled out that verse. I forget where it was, but, but Jesus said, if you can be trusted with little, you can be trusted with more. And I'm guaranteeing you that she did not leave that place worse than what she came in. I believe God looked at her and said, you know what? As Jesus is teaching the disciples over in the corner, the Bible says, he's probably going, all right, I can trust her with more. And we don't get the rest of the story, but maybe Jesus walked up to her later and put his arm around her and said, listen, I I just saw what you did. You gave more than anyone else. So when you go home today, open up your cupboard just above the fridge there. And there's going to be a blessing there for you. I just know that's how Jesus works. He's faithful to his word. And so he uses this lady and he praises her. And we still are reading and talking about this sacrificial giving that she did. And Jesus allowed her to give it. But if I were a financial tra- or a counselor, I probably would have said, no, no, keep it. Go buy self, yourself something with it. And then in Luke chapter 12, there's a story of a rich farmer. And Jesus said, this is how it is with anyone who stores up for themselves things on earth and is not rich towards God. This is what happens. Jesus is like, this is what I think of people who are greedy. People who are just about getting more and more and more, and they're never rich towards God. They're not generous. Jesus said, you know what I refer to them as? A fool. It's foolish. not being rich towards God, you're being rich toward yourself. And so the question, I guess, that we can conclude today is, who are you and I being rich toward? These are, these are very powerful, meaningful questions that we have to regularly ask ourselves because God is watching every single one of us with intense interest to see what we're doing with his money. Because we read, we started off, Psalm chapter 24 says, I don't own a thing. It's all his, the earth and all who dwell within it. It's all God's. He owns everything. 
And he's very interested in knowing how Bill Mead is going to spend his money. Very interested. Randy Alcorn said this, The issue is not if you are wealthy or not wealthy. It's not a bad thing to be wealthy. The issue is if each of us is rich towards God in our finances. That's the key right there. If we're truly, if we truly trust God, then why do we work so hard to depend less on Him? Like it's why we get stressed out all the time, right? It's because we're working so hard not to depend on God. The early church looked at it as a privilege to give. And Paul said, not only are we to excel in the grace of giving, but we need to have the desire to do so. And so, I want to end with this verse. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Do you know that God often is measuring stick to our thankfulness to Him is whether or not we're rich toward Him. Did you know that? He says something like, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so who, who, who am I being rich toward? Who are you being rich toward? Is it ourselves or is it, is it the work of God? Is it His kingdom? Because, because He will, he will we'll be enriched in every way, not so that we get to keep it and, and hoard it for ourselves, but he says, I will bless you in every way so that on every occasion you can be generous. Do you understand that? Are you getting this today? He actually gives us blessings so we can be a blessing. And the more you are a blessing, the more he gives and blesses. And so many times, when we are not rich toward others, and we sit back and go, well, I don't know what Bill's talking about. I don't know what the Bible says, because, man, I got more than enough. And to be honest, I'm not that generous to the work of God. And I just would like to propose this to you, that um, that's not God's blessing. That's you blessing yourself. There's a big difference. I'd rather have the blessing of God upon my life. Not his curse. And so maybe you're thinking, well, how do I give God the first and the best then? Like, what does that look like in my life when it comes to the income that he's asked me to steward? And if he's looking with intense interest to see how I'm spending his money, then how, how am I supposed to spend it? What am I supposed to do? Well, I want to give you practical tools. Next week, we're going to talk about how to do that according to scriptures. And we're going to talk about tithes. We're going to talk about offerings the following week. We're going to help you out to understand practical ways of giving God the first and the best when it comes to our income. But it's going to take some work on our part. It's going to take some priority shifting. It's going to take us to re-examine what matters in life, what counts. But I guess the question will be all, it would be good for all of us to ask when we go home today or we go home and we're, we're, we're sitting around our turkey dinners and we're having great conversation and we're spending time with people we love and care for. We're about to put our head on our pillow tonight. Or maybe you get a little time alone sometime today and you look in the mirror. Can we all ask a question? The same question. God, who am I being rich toward? Is it you? Or is it myself? God, the money that you've given me, because I don't own a thing, that money, God, like, am I honoring you with it? Am I pleased? Are you pleased with me? God, this money that you've entrusted to me, am I a good steward of that? Am I honoring you with the first and the best? Those are questions that are so important to ask ourselves because we're reminded in Proverbs maybe I don't have it up there it says honor the Lord with your wealth honor the Lord with your wealth and so maybe you're here today and you're thinking well, well, well you know what I'm, and I've had this said to me 
numerous times over the years. That's just Old Testament teaching. Ah, I dare you to come out the next couple of weeks. Because you will find out that's not just Old Testament teaching. Matter of fact, the New Testament raises the bar. It's all about putting God first and giving Him our best. And so I'm going to invite you to stand today. I've asked uh, the greeters to pass around offering plates. I'm kidding. I am kidding. And we don't want to. We don't want to be manipulative. Manipulative. Whatever. However you say that word. Because because this is this is not like a, 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 just a quick. Oh, you know what? I I feel like yeah, I should do better. No, this is a lifestyle. This is not a one-time thing. This will change your life. This will take mountains of stress off of your shoulders. There's something supernatural about being a generous person. God will bless you to be a blessing. That's just how he does it. And so, so maybe you're, you're in this place and you're like, man, it, times are tough, inflation's high, groceries are expensive. I don't know how we're gonna do it. Can I give you some advice? Be generous. That doesn't make sense. I know, I know. Most of the stuff in this book doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense on paper. It doesn't make sense to us as human beings who our minds are so small. But in God's eyes, what what doesn't make sense culturally makes a full sense when it comes to how he does things. I don't know how it works. All I know is that when we are generous, God takes care of the things that we can't take care of. So I'm going to encourage you the next number of weeks come out because we're going to talk about practical ways that you can walk in God's, in God's provision. Practical ways of how you can, like you can have him first and best in your life. And then you can just unload mountains of stress that you just don't have to carry around in life. And, and I'm not telling you because I've read this. I'm telling you because I read it and then it caught on and I've been living it for decades. It really works. It's so encouraging talking to some of you. And you're like, yeah, when I, when I started putting God first in my finances, I, I actually, it was so obvious things shifted in, in our lives. Things changed. They will change for you if you're not there yet. It's going to take some faith. Just like those people in the, in the, in the, in the, in the Bible when they would take their firstborn. God, I'm going to have to trust you to provide the rest. Took that step of faith. And so I want to pray for all of us today that we would have the boldness and courage to take God upon his word. Did you know it's, it's the one thing that God says, go ahead and try me. He's like, you test me in your finances. You put me first and see if I will not take care of you. It's the one thing he gives us permission to do. He says, go ahead and try me. And so I think we need to do that if we've not done it before. And so, Father, today you see all of us standing here, and you know our hearts. You know that our hearts are connected to the money that you've entrusted to us. And, Lord, we don't want to hoard your provision. We don't want to hold on to it tightly. God, we don't want to bless ourselves. But, God, we want your blessing. And to receive your blessing, we have to bless you. And so, Father, today we're not in any way coming before you with false motives thinking well if I give to you I'm going to get back even more that's not at all God your blessing is way beyond finances you can bless us with health great relationships a sound mind Lord you can bless us with just just your favor over our lives it trickles down to our kids and those around us Father there's so many ways that you can bless but God you bless us so we become blessings and so today, Lord, you see our church. You see those that are visiting, maybe going back to their church, Lord, with a, with a whole new perspective on, on, on your ways and how, how to do life when it comes to what you've entrusted to us. And for those that are part of Streams Church, Lord, those watching today online, God, we want to do it your way. We really want to do it your way. And so, Father, would you just convict our hearts. Convict our hearts, Lord, to trust you trust you, 
to trust you. Lord, we have a city to reach for you and, and often, Lord, you use our resources to do it. I pray, Lord, that we would be a church known for its generosity, known for making a difference in our city, our province, our country, our world. Lord, you've called all of us to be a part of this, this worldwide movement. And so as we leave this place today, Lord, do what you need to do. Challenge us where you need to challenge us. Rebuke us where we need to be rebuked. Lord, encourage us where we need encouragement. God, we do this for you. On this Thanksgiving, we have so much to be thankful for. Lord, most of us today are going to leave this place and fill our stomachs with food that you provided. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Lord, thank you for our relationships. Thank you for family. Thank you for friends. Thank you, God, for giving us hope. Thank you, Lord, our King, our Lord, our provider. You love us more than we'll ever know. And Lord, we want to give to you what's already yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, now we just go and live it. We just go and live it. We go and do it. Come back next week and we'll talk about ways that we can actually honor God in our giving. See you Wednesday night for those of you who uh, who are going to come out to our Alpha and bring, bring a friend, somebody else. And again, if you don't have somewhere to spend Thanksgiving, come talk to me after. We'll work it all out. Oh, if, if you, one more thing, if you did, which is too late now, my, I made a mistake, but if you fill one of these out and you put it in the offering box, can you just come down to the information desk down at the thing? We have a little gift for you if this is your first time with us today. God bless you. Happy Thanksgiving. We'll see you again this week or next week. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Cause your name is power Your name